Hey everybody, I'm back for another episode of the podcast and I have James Rostance with me. James, welcome. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to grill you and if you've never seen one of these podcasts, God help you because poor James has no idea what I'm going to say next. And I love doing this way because sometimes when you do a podcast, it's quite scripted and quite rigid and this is going to be whatever we say comes out, right? Mm -hmm. So James, tell us, a little bit about Story Hero and what you get up to there. So Story Hero, I specialize uh, purely in producing video case studies and story-based uh, video case studies, which uh, tell the story of what the challenges a business's customers were up against, why they're a problem, and what they had to take on board for solving that problem, and then set about uh, revealing why they chose the company who's paying for the case study, and why their product or service was a good fit. Okay, so just to be difficult from the beginning. Yes. Uh, a lot of people will be using case studies already. There'll be PDFs, there'll be testimonial style case studies. Why do you think people should do video case studies? Well, when it comes to written versus video case studies, the, the big problem with written is that... Uh, Nobody truly wants to read a 1,500-word case study, and video is unquestionably the preferred medium. So if you would prefer to watch a video versus reading a long report, then so too would your uh, potential customers. And I guess the other thing is down to authenticity, because with a, a written case study, uh, it can be embellished or completely made uh, up. That was very up. diplomatic. It was <laughs> you, mean, you mean a bit mm. of spin on it, right? Good yeah. old... Tony Blair spin on it, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, um, exactly. And today's B two B buyers uh, are well, first of all, smart, and they they, they also I think uh, have a healthy degree of skepticism. So this is why written case studies really don't cut the mustard so much now. Whereas with a video case study, if it's your customer on screen and you can see them talking and saying the things which uh, are the case study is about, then as far as authenticity and credibility, you've got full scores, and that's why. And, and one of the things I find, it's particularly in like a competitive environment where it's like, is it this company or this company? It isn't about like a big game-changing thing. It's little things that make the marginal difference, isn't it? You don't, I think we talked about this earlier, you don't lose because you're, proposal was shit you lose it because somebody else was marginally better hmm. would you say that video case studies give you that margin yes it's about as you say giving you the, the vendor company the edge and and to help stack the argument or uh, the points in your favor and and even if it is only a small bit, for example, if that's what it's going to take to win you the deal, then the exercise is is all worth it. Yeah, like in a in a kind of I'm a bit politics obsessed, but in a in a kind of an election, yeah, you can win by being two or three percent over your competitor, and that two or three percent is made up of effectively people believing you more than somebody else. Mm -hmm. When it boils down to it, it's about human belief, right? For sure, for sure. Uh, and ultimately, the, the, a, a video case study is what well, it's a combined sales and marketing tool. It, it, it does a huge amount of the weight of the weightlifting for marketing, and equally, it does uh, comparatively a huge amount for the sales conversation, which a sales team otherwise has to take a, uh, a prospect through in order to move them towards uh, the end uh, where they make a decision as to who to, um, to go for. Mm -hmm. And often I find when somebody's making their minds up, it's not always about, yes, it's about who who is the best company, who do we get along with, who has the best value, you know, the best proposal. There is that element, but there's also an element of who's the least risky. Mm -hmm. So um, in the consulting world, you know, there's this saying, there's obviously some big consulting firms, there's about four or five of them. Nobody gets fired for hiring one of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes I think in, in proposal scenarios where people are trying, hmm, trying to kind of weigh up, they are kind of looking at, which is the safest bet? 
because very few businesses can offer ultimate certainty of anything, really, unless you're making a widget. Then you can say that widget will be the same every time. But if you're selling a service, people are looking at going, which is the best service? They don't really know. So they, they look at what's the risks, the pros and the cons. And part of, I would guess, them watching that video of a client saying how good your service was kind of gives them an, an, another level of reassurance because it's coming out of somebody else's mouth. For sure, yes. Uh, and actually, th that's a good point because uh, when it comes to, say, your company is really good at protecting a uh, a buyer's uh, interest against something bad happening, uh, you might w w very well know that, oh, well, of course, we've got that covered because we've got this process in place and we do this and we deliver it in a certain way. But because you, it might, it's all very well that you know that you deliver it and have that covered, but it's another thing for the prospective buyer, for them to fully appreciate how you've got their back covered and, uh, and how they would otherwise stand to be at risk or how they would stand to benefit if only they had your help. So it's one thing for you to say, we've got your back and we do this to keep you safe, but it's way more powerful and way more effective if your client is then able to cover this in the video case study and articulate that because it lands so much uh, stronger in the eyes of mm -hmm. um, the prospective buyer. Now, I know there's some secret sauce here, so I can't ask you all of these questions, right. but some people would say it's really difficult getting people to give you testimonials. It's quite difficult to get people time constraints, um, nervous about where it's going to end up. What can you share? Because you've got a very unique way of doing it, and um, you'd kill me if I told people about it. Yeah. But you've got a new, very unique way of telling that story, your own method. What are some of the things that you can share about how you get such great conversations for clients on camera? Sure. Uh, well, in terms of setting it up to start with, uh, you, are, you are right. I mean, regardless of how amazing the client relationship is, to do a case study, it's still an ask on their part. You're still asking for time, which is in turn is money from the, uh, from the client. And you also, as part of that, you're likely going to need to uh, inconvenience uh, the rest of their business. Because whenever you do a video case study, uh, you can't really do it just based on the interview. You've got to get what's known as uh, B-roll footage, which is the client's business in action. So in order to get that, you're going to be disrupting to a certain degree that client's business so really the the key for addressing that is to is to engineer a win-win situation so that uh, both of you win from uh, producing the, the case study and, in, uh, and what was the other part you asked about um, the, asking them what what can you tell about the way you the method of how you not only get them on camera which you kind of said create the win-win yeah yeah but how do you how do you land the right message because like it's not just about like you said it's not just about talking heads like a documentary kind of thing mm -hmm. you've got to kind of land a story so what can you share about how you do that bit without giving away the crown jewels but how do you get that remembered how what are some of the secrets about how you get that remembered what's the the the, the secret there that you can share. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I guess a large part of it is, is as the video producer, understanding in detail what is special about your product or service. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that you shouldn't be uh, saying about doing is, is open, uh, asking open-ended questions and hoping that the client featured gives a good answer. In, in fact, I know for a fact that that is the approach that nearly all video producers take in producing case studies. And it comes from the fact that uh, video production companies like doing fun, exciting stuff, or what they consider fun, exciting. Okay, uh, so these are promo videos and uh, and, and show uh, website openers, and sure they'll do a video case study if they're asked, and the approach will be to uh, fire get, off, get me to say anything, and, yes. and hope out of that we get something good. E exactly, and and that, and that is a terrible way of going about producing any kind of collateral, hoping you're going to come up with a good result. So so this is why you. 
need to, to really understand the, your client, you with the client's business, um, how to sell it, uh, because really this is a sales tool. So w- as a producer, once I can understand how to sell your product or service and what makes people buy and also what you've got over your competitors, say where your competitors let other buyers down potentially or put or them at risk. weaknesses in their potential Weaknesses in their offering, yes. Once... I as a producer know that, then we can structure the interview so that we can have the client covering these points and with that making just a knockout after knockout in terms of it's it's kind of almost addressing like the point. You might get offended and walk off at this point, but have you seen the latest round of political interview? You tell I'm obsessed with politics. <laughs> yeah. But you see like um the two conservative candidates being interviewed for leader. Yeah, and most of the questions that are asked are like your policy. You want to cut taxes, but what about the people who are earning less than ten thousand a year? What are you going to do for them? And it's kind of like the negative version of what you're talking about is <laughs> is basically where you you mm-hmm. you force an agenda, but in a very natural way that quite requires an answer. Now we see this negatively in journalism where. Mm. Basically, people are set up to answer silly questions. Uh, you know, uh, one of your colleagues said that you don't have a clue on taxation. How do you respond to that? Well, you can't respond to that in the media. They, mm-hmm. they put out an, an agenda and an angle that you either look like you're dodging the question or you come out with a wishy-washy answer because you don't want to fall into a trap. That's where I class as hack journalism. Yeah, yeah. But what you're saying, some of those... They, they do very closed questions. And we are trained to try, you know, say open, open-ended questions, you get better conversations. But actually when you're trying to capture somebody saying something that's going to add value to your business, you don't want to do that at all, right? That's what you're saying. Without turning into Beth Rigby or, you know, Andrew <laughs> Neal or any of those where they just trap people. But, but yeah. in a sense, I know this sounds horrible way of putting it, you are trying to say, let's make sure your agenda comes out in the video. It shouldn't be an unbiased video. It should be biased to help you, right? Yes, that is is very much on on uh, on the right track because it, what's driving this is that collectively we're setting out to produce a sales and marketing tool, and success will be defined as to whether or not this video helps progress the sales uh, conversation and and helps nurture uh, an educated uh, uh, buyer who appreciates their problem and also then at the end of it appreciates why you're better able to help them with it more than any any other. So because we've got the end goal in mind, which is to create a sales tool that will perform as that, that is what uh, guides us in uh, steering the conversation to talk about certain areas because if we do that, then we will create, as far as the business is concerned, the perfect sales video. And I guess, you know, without kind of critiquing the video production world, anybody can buy a camera now. Yeah, yeah. Anybody can, you know, buy some lights on eBay and do all of that stuff and have a setup and they can charge themselves out at £400 a day. But what you're saying is it's not that bit. Yes, all the cameras are important, but it's not that bit, right? It's not. It's not just oh, I can film a video. It's the way it's produced that makes the result. 100%, yes, yeah, yeah. And I guess, if anything, that's the unique thing that I bring to the table is, is that my background is equally split between B2B marketing uh, and video TV production. Uh, normally, you will get someone that's just a video producer. They might know a bit about marketing, but if you were to ask them, what, what do you do? I'm in video production. But my take has always been I'm equally split between the two. So, yes, by fusing them together, mm-hmm. that's why we're able to produce an incredibly powerful video so tool. when we're talking about how do we get the best out of our clients to say the things that we want them to say, one of the challenges is, Sometimes you have to ask questions that draw those answers out. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some, I don't know whether they're classed as case studies, but they're they're certainly talking heads. And you kind of look at them and go, this is like boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's just like somebody talking, waffling on, like me now, but not really 
kind of landing any key points. I mean, when you're doing a video, I don't know what the stats are at the moment, but you see it on all the social media channels. You've got to hold people's attention. Mm. They don't they don't stick around for very long. How do you do that in I mean, how long should a video case study be? And what are some of the that you do share out of your expertise, things that you've got to go, how am I going to hold people's attention? Right. Well, first of all, uh, the sweet spot for a video case study is anywhere between three to four minutes. Uh, any less than that. That's in... quite a long time, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, ah, no, no, I shouldn't say yes, it is. Um, if It depends how you look at it. So the the case study is the full length feature version and now if you were say trying to put that on linkedin or any other social channel and just stick on a full length uh, video case study yeah correct chances are well, you would have a hard job getting people to watch it from the outset so this is why a, a spot of strategy thinking uh, comes into this in that your video case study should be placed on a dedicated page on your website for that particular problem or need and that, that particular vertical maybe uh, that, that you ultimately address with that case study. But then working backwards from that, uh, as far as a funnel is concerned, the process is to tease interest in that subject. So you would create um, shortcuts from that case study video to tease that particular issue there or that particular talking point. And then at the end of these videos, you then uh, have a call to action, say, right, to find out uh, more about this and to learn the full story, click here to watch the full length. Mm -hmm. So. It's what the movie industry does all the time with yeah. to Top Gun. There we go. We saw plenty of uh, shortcuts of that. The same process applies. So you would have the one kind of masterpiece yeah. which really lays it all down, but actually teasers that feed into that to kind of go, actually, there's some, oh, oh well, they solved this problem. Mm -hmm. Almost like your trailers. Yeah. So you've got video trailers, uh, but then also working uh, really well is uh, PDF carousels mm -hmm. on uh, LinkedIn, still images, straightforward um, posts. In, in fact, even social pictures of you out and about doing whatever. And then that your post on LinkedIn can be then talking about the, uh, or leading up to talking about the problems and symptoms which were addressed in the case study. And then at the end of it, oh, by the way, uh, if you want to uh, find out the full story, go to this page to watch this case study in full. So there are many, many different ways of pulling people down into the funnel to watch the full length case study. But just know that the end of the road is the case study. And, on, and then finally, on that case study page uh, is some kind of mechanism to arrange a sales call and the, the, the next step. But all roads lead to the uh, video case study page. Yeah, cool. I get it. So... Out of that masterpiece of content, how do you get it remembered? Because we all watch loads of stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. What's what's something that really makes that memorable? For me, it, it has to be in the B-roll footage. Uh, well, actually, no. There's, you know, there's two things. Right? Well, first of all, uh, the guest has to be looking on points. Um, I see it far too often where, where 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 people haven't put enough thought into where the guest is is positioned you know in what room what, what, what the lighting is like their positioning everything so first of all you've got to get them looking good yeah. uh, but after that then the b-roll the b-roll footage is how you keep their interest uh, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter what your age now we're all conditioned to have quite short attention spans when it comes to online content so the way you do that is you would not really have a shot on screen uh, in terms of b-roll uh, we don't use them for anything more than, say, four seconds at, at a push. Uh, so the video itself is driven by the interview with the subject. You will see them on screen uh, for a short periods of time, but the rest of the time you've got fast cut B-roll footage of that client's business in action, showing the thing that they're delivering on how they produce so it's it. it's constantly changing. Yes. You've got to make it engaging because... Well, if you wouldn't want to watch uh, a stuffy, boring, slow-paced corporate video... Do you know what? If I go onto Netflix, uh -huh. right, if the first like minute of the film hasn't got me, it's like, this is gone. This is gone. There you go. Yeah. And that's a film where I'm preparing to sit down and go, I'll give this an hour and a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. But actually, I'll judge it on a minute. Yep. Now, on a four-minute video, how long would you judge? What, seconds? Yeah. It, seconds. Uh, and in fact, that is a key part of um, producing uh, a video case study. It's got to have a really strong hook right at the beginning to uh, 
a signal or communicate to uh, the viewer that this is going to be worth your time. You're going to learn something from this. This is going to benefit you. And then after you've hooked them in successfully, then yes, uh, uh, going on further, shortcuts of nicely filmed footage of the business in action is how you keep the stimulation going. And you're putting effort in into all this to make a great piece of content because this is, this is going to be a signature piece of content that you're going to drive a lot of traffic to. So my thought behind it all is if you're going to be driving all this traffic to it, then put in the effort to make it looking good. And then you as a company can then go, I'm really proud of that. But so... I'm just going to be more difficult. Sorry, James. <laughs> do it. <laughs> do you think, though, it's tricky for a business to do this themselves? I don't mean technically, because you, you can go on Amazon and buy cameras. Yeah. I think the story piece is actually really tricky. I mean, I'm massive film buff, right? Uh -huh. I've seen so many films that have come out, and it's like, oh, we've got to touch this topic. We've got to hit this agenda. We've got to hit this. And what happens is the story becomes a mess. Uh -huh. And at the end of it, you know, I'm a big sci-fi. I'll just go into the sci-fi thing. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm a big Star, Star Trek fan and nuts, yes. right? I don't dress up and wear the ears or anything, but um, I'm I'm close, <laughs> <laughs> right? So they they've made a new series. They brought some of the old cast back, and it's a ten episode series. And literally, you can feel when they've gone. Ah, we need to extend this story or we need to push this particular point, or they push a point that then they don't really fulfill or pay off. And then when you watch it, you go, this was such a waste of my time mm -hmm. because they messed with the story mm -hmm. by trying to land too many points. Yeah. Or, or, you know, they talk about A and B plots. This had like A, Z, Z, A, 1. There was like a gazillion different plots, and it was like, this is a mess. But somebody, some Hollywood producer signed off on this and said it was great. But when the audience saw it, it was like, this is a mess. Do you think sometimes when a business tries to produce something themselves, mm -hmm. they can end up with a very convoluted message, too many points, uh, or emphasizing points that don't really matter? Mm -hmm. the, the, the adage that springs to mind is all the gear, no idea. Yes, you can have the kit, uh, but storytelling in itself is an art form. It is difficult to do it well. And yeah, when it comes to either TV series or, or a film, the one thing that you judge on, whether it's good or bad, is not down to the special effects, or you'd be having a push to do bad special effects these days, but it's not special effects, it's not the camera lenses necessarily, it, it, it's um, likely not uh, the actors generally, it's the story. And to expect someone internally in a company to be able to, uh, uh, be a, a craftsman or woman in writing a story it is a really big ask. You've got to be really lucky to, to be able to do that. Uh, so I would say generally that that's not a realistic uh, expectation mm -hmm. for be able to do it because ultimately the story is the thing that drives it and that's what the most important thing. Uh, and, and how would you, because everybody talks about storytelling. Everybody says storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. Yeah. But what does it really mean? Oh, that's a good one. So, because uh, you know, I see yeah. on LinkedIn with people said, "I'm a storyteller," <laughs> and I'm like, but "What does that mean?" <laughs> yes, um, they might be a storyteller, but are they any good at it? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really the, the thing that applies. Um, for me, it's about taking the viewer on a journey uh, and it starts with first of all getting their attention making them care getting them invested in seeing how it pl uh, plays out and and then also in a way rooting for the individual and uh, this is why uh, one of the reasons why I called it story heroes is, is because it's based around making your client the hero of the story uh, because uh, I need to be careful in, in describing this because it's not technically true to say that a story definitely needs a hero mm -hmm. for it to be a story because you can have an a, a hero, an anti-hero, and there's an, another 
a variation of it. But generally speaking, you need a hero in a story. So my concept is to, rather than you talk about yourself and your company, how great, great everything is, if you make your client the hero and you, you're really focusing on what they did when they discovered they had a problem and how they set about fixing it and the, the measures they took and ultimately how they personally achieved this uh, great outcome, which your company was involved in, but were it not for, for your client having done their due diligence, done their research, and ultimately chosen you, they would not have had that result. So it's about focusing on them, the hero. So going back to your point of storytelling, it really is an art form to do that properly, to take people on a journey and to hit all of those points. So at the end of it, uh, the the viewer feels good for having watched it and that they've learned something from it as well, because that's, mm. that's the reason why someone would want to uh, set about watching and the video learning isn't that they should do business with you there's, no, there's another story no no that. that's the takeaway uh, but the reason uh, that, that people will watch a video case study is because it sets up the ability for them to learn how to avoid pain or, in, or uh, be it the other way around for them to achieve the results that someone else similar to them has uh, has been able to realise and do you think that's why a lot of case studies are so or a lot of videos end up so flat because there's nothing for people to take away uh, yeah the reason why that, that, that's a, a, a polite way of putting it I, I, I'm not I normally just say look most case studies suck <laughs> because they do they're, they're typically no more than adverts disguised as case studies which really annoys uh, buyers because if someone is researching their problem or need that they have, they first go through a research process. And nowadays, B2B buyers are spending, here we go, it was 34% more time researching uh, a product or service now post-pandemic than before the pandemic. So people want to do the, uh, the research. And when they're doing research, they're not ready to be sold to yet. That that comes later. But the problem comes when marketers set about producing case studies, be it a written one or even a video case study, they will, they will first of all introduce the person. And then uh, it's very common for you to have anywhere between 10 to 30 seconds of the, cu of the customer talking about their company and how long they've been in business. At that point, no one cares. Well, they, they don't have a reason to care at that point. <laughs> But after they briefly introduce the problem, they will then spend the rest of the video talking about how wonderful the product or service is, and they will be focusing on the features and benefits of the product or service. That's not a case study. That's a, that, that's a, that's a promo video. And yeah. I'm not bashing promo videos. You do need promo videos. Just don't mislead people because if someone wants to watch a promo video and, and there's a need for a promo video, great, give them that. But if you are setting out to capitalize on the opportunity which connecting with a buyer during the research process, by by providing them with a video case study, then give them a, a video case study. Don't give them one that's disguised, uh, an advert that's disguised Propaganda, as one. Propaganda, basically. It, it, it is. And that's not a good way to start a relationship. Lying. <laughs> which is what, well, which I, is what I think it comes from, we're so keen to get business. Uh, we go, oh, we've got to say this, we've yeah. got to say that. But actually, at the end of it, they've watched the four minutes. They're not going to remember word for word. They're only going to remember some key things. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, I, in training, right, if you do 10 minutes of training, uh, within 30 minutes, most people have forgotten 80% of it. That's the stat in my world in training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I give you a 10-minute training session, at the end of it, half an hour later, you're only going to remember mm. 20%. So in a video case study, you've the challenge you've got in a video is you've got to land something despite having four minutes, you've got to land something really concise that they remember in amongst all the other things you want to say. How would you go about making sure you don't go all in on emphasizing loads of stuff and miss that key message you've got to leave them with? That's a great question. Um, I would say it comes back to using the vehicle of true storytelling because if someone hits you with loads of facts and stats... Uh, I guess that's kind of like throwing uh, whatever it is at the wall and hoping some of it sticks, but generally it's going to fall off. 
But the reason why using true storytelling as a vehicle is that stories are inherently memorable. And it's why you can very easily recount a story and tell someone else's story, hitting most of the points in it because you've done it as a story. Whereas if someone comes along and tells you a series of stats, are you going to be... This is an example off the, top my, off the top of my head. Are you, going to, are you going to be able to recount those stats just as well as that person did versus you retelling a story that someone's just told you? So I don't know how true this is, mm. but I heard somebody said the best and disagree or agree is the best way to communicate with somebody is if you leave them with a picture in their head when you finish talking. That's nice. And I was like, yeah, because we think in pictures, don't we? Mm -hmm. Like if I talk about a tin of beans right now, some people who are watching this are going to be imagining a tin of beans. We don't think of the word we imagine the picture. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm doing it now. I've got a label of Heinz beans in my head as I'm thinking now about beans. We actually create pictures. And I think, is that why story storytelling works? Because it causes us to think about it in pictures. That's an interesting consideration. Um, as you were saying that, what I was thinking is that if you're dealing with... Uh, a, a video story you've got multiple sensory inputs both and you're giving them the pictures yes yeah, so you'll see a factory or whatever yeah or auditory visual input and doing what you mentioned there of, of they're then I, I guess visualizing in their head how that would play out for their company if they did the same thing and followed the same route so if anything you're hitting three inputs in in, in a way to a person's mm conscious or subconscious which in turn then would help land it uh more strongly in their mind and heck if your marketing can land more strongly than your competitors uh well if, if they remember it if you if if you're remembered more than your competitors that's the essence of building a brand mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know we you know if you look at most you know coca-cola i put a post on linkedin today and i had a pepsi can right in front and I put it, I put it there, and thought, I wonder how many people will comment on the Pepsi can. Um, and most people spotted the Pepsi can straight in front. And I was just thinking, sometimes these visual cues really prompt people in ways that wouldn't happen written down. Okay. And I was like, so I put it there, and it was like, are you on a paid promotion, Dean? Somebody said. <laughs> and I had a few people. I said, because I put it, I, it wasn't a post I put up this morning. It, the picture I took earlier or later a few days ago but obviously i put it up this morning early with me with a can of pepsi max so it looked like at seven o'clock in the morning i was drinking a can of pepsi max and and people created it created a picture of people saying what are you doing with pepsi max at seven in the morning that's not a healthy lifestyle um but it is these pictures that we put up and i find this on social media the more you make something real to somebody the more they retain that information. So like um, I do a lot of PDF posts, a lot of them, a lot of um, image posts. But what I found is doing more videos, the views aren't as good as my PDFs. Mm. But more people say, ah, I feel like I know Dean now because of the videos. Personality comes across and all of that stuff that doesn't come across on paper mm. or can be misinterpreted. Do you think, just more generally, video is the ultimate kind of content consumption. Based on on ease, y yes, yeah, uh, and it's not the easiest to produce, but it is the easiest to engage with a human. For sure, yeah, yeah, yes. I hate TikTok videos. <laughs> uh, I'm not on there yet. Um, it's really difficult. Mm. Uh, not because, not because I think it's the shortness of you've got to do something and get it across quickly. Yeah. But also it's the format of portrait I find really tricky. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you get used to camera stands and everything, and, and now it's like, I can't even get my phone to stand up that way. It is tricky, isn't it, to, to do video in a way well and land it quickly. I'm thinking TikToks and stuff like that and stories and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It is diff Do you find it difficult? Uh, 
for me, a uh, v- vertical video is, is, the, is, is the most awful thing that has happened to the video production industry for the past, well, 25 uh, <laughs> years. The only problem is that the kind of video production industry's lost that battle. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's awful. And in fact, when I'm taking photos, I will find myself now doing the way I'd normally do it, a not proper photo, lands- uh, landscape, and then you uh, do one of the, the exact same one again. So your photo library's got two versions of the same thing. But it's um, tough to get a video. I found, like, doing a 60-second video and landing a message fast is, mm. is difficult. Yes, because what, in 60-second video, you've got up to 180 words if you're talking quickly. Uh, because, yeah, the formula you work on is three words per second off a bit. So, actually, uh, you're probably looking at about 150 words. How can you get across some insightful content during that time? I'm... You know what, I, I am going to be giving that some thought. Uh, but I think for anyone that puts in the effort in these kind of things, uh, then if you do put in the effort, and then if ever, everyone else is just bashing out mindless nonsense, but maybe you produce less of it, but the the, the quality of the, the media is higher, then maybe you will get remembered more because, ah, compared to everyone else, I'm actually learning something from this, uh, this, this person. Have you been following... Uh, or have you heard of Mr. Beast? I know of him and I've seen one or two of the videos. Yeah, yeah. So he's, uh, it's an interesting business model of what he's doing with video because he's basically creating loads of videos, but he claims that every penny he makes, he puts back into the videos. Mm, And he's done one recently, um, which was it? It was the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And he built... Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Obviously, this guy's worked up to this or he's got outside money somewhere. But he spent more than four and a half million dollars on this video, sold a sponsorship to somebody else okay. and made his own chocolate bar out of it. And he's made four and a half million dollars and spent four and a half million dollars. <laughs> okay. And, and you look at that and you go, why did you not spend three and a half million dollars? And he said, it's not his... It's not his bag. He wants to invest everything in to make the best possible videos to be known for making the best possible videos. You go on YouTube Shorts now and everything is Mr. Beast. Everything. And this guy isn't your classic Andrew Tate. He's quite, you know, (laughs) he's not bold and cocky and all of those things. He's like this really kind of chilled out, ordinary looking guy. Mm -hmm. But because he's got his content right, it's flying. Um... I think sometimes businesses miss this, mm. that they are effectively their own, they're a television company that sells stuff. Yeah, yeah, yes. Every business is that now, right? Uh, Tele- yeah. I'm using television as an example. But mm. every, every business has, should be producing content that's consumed and you happen to sell widgets or you happen to Exactly, sell- yes. A, a media company that produces um, uh, dosing systems for industry and motors that kind of thing yeah, yeah. uh i suppose we're, do- we're doing it now yeah, yeah yeah uh i suppose ultimately you've got the, that ongoing battle of uh needing to stand out from the noise and then if everyone else is doing one thing then really sense would dictate you go and do the opposite so if everyone else is putting out short form um um very light content in, t- in terms of what you can learn from it, mm-hmm. then the opposite of that is to put in effort to deliver real educational mm-hmm. value. Because I think there's the, the two things that people will, will watch. It's either generally it's, it's uh, uh, entertainment, uh, comedy, mm-hmm. or education. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd put forward that you'd be struggling a bit in B2B to get, go down the entertainment route. You probably could, but then how does that link to your product or service? Far better... I think, to go down the education route. So mm-hmm. put in the effort to well, it's educate like, properly. It's like um, you've got Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah, very, very long-form content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there are some funny bits, but there's a lot of useful and interesting information in them. Uh, you've got people like Jordan Peterson, who's gone very long-form on YouTube. Um, now he's obviously snippeted it up everywhere because all of his sound bites have been chopped up, but... He put a three-hour lecture on YouTube, mm-hmm. and like millions of people would watch it. Mm. And I think 
what you said earlier about with the video case studies, if you put out something of length, you can chop it up. You can tease it. Maybe that's maybe I'm answering my own question. Maybe the answer is to do more long form and chop up rather than try and do short form and and go the other way. I think that uh, well, that is definitely the way to go because um, you can you can chop up something big and wholesome into smaller pieces, but you can't do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, it's a very efficient use of time, energy, resources to be producing something that's your cornerstone bit of content and then chop it down into in, and repurpose it into smaller bits to drive traffic to drive interest to the main show mm -hmm. uh, other people aren't doing that generally speaking so i think the smart money's on taking that approach yeah i mean that's that's where i think videos videos come into its own now it's so accessible that many people can produce it so yeah yeah the key is is the quality, because uh, I'm going to break the rules here, but is the quality the camera and the microphone or is it what's said and shared? The uh, content is always king. Uh, I've always stuck by that. And, and that, that applies now more than ever because... Uh, because other people can go out and they can get nice cameras or and they can hire someone to film something that looks nice, then whereas previously, when I want to say previously, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, there, then you did need a healthy budget to, have, to produce a professional-looking corporate video. Mm -hmm. uh, and that previously was one of the key differentiators. But nowadays, because pretty much everything is in 4K, the quality aspect is not necessarily a, a differentiating factor. And I'm, why I'm, the reason why I'm saying not necessarily is that I do not advocating, advocate producing crappy content. Um, the, the, there's, there's no need. But driving it, the most important thing, though, is definitely uh, the content. That is what's going to give you the separation, and that's what's going to help you but better. But cr crappy content is decided by the audience, right? Mm. Does it achieve its job? How do you define what is um, with the, yeah, good or bad content? Whether or not it delivers, in a B2B context, whether or not it delivers educational value to the viewer and whether it helps them understand their problem better and whether uh, it helps move them along the buyer's journey. Uh, what I would say is that, well, let's say you've got the content and you, you're focused on producing high-quality educational content, you've got the written and the spoken stuff right, then why not make it look good? Uh, if you've got the uh, resources and capability of doing that, well, if you've got a budget to be able to do it, then there's no reason why you should deliberately make it look bad. Uh, also, you've got, uh, uh, as far as l larger companies are concerned, if you're putting out content that, that is ropey, then it reflects on you. So you've got a brand image thing as, mm -hmm. as well. So... I say get both both bases covered. See, I would say, coming back to my Star Trek thing, mm. right? Star Trek Picard. Right? Yes. Have you seen it? Not the new series, but I, uh, I right. used to watch the uh, original. So, Star Trek Picard has got all the special effects and everything. Okay. You can't fault it for all of that, but the story is just a mess. Right, there you go. Yeah, right? yeah. But when you hear the production team talking about it, ah, oh, it was great work, some really great <laughs> storytelling and all this stuff. But the fan base goes, that was crap. Right. You made an iconic character look like a doddering old fool and your own story unpicked itself. For me, for me, quality content is decided by the audience not by the producer, mm. which makes it more difficult because you can, you know, I can arbitrarily judge and go, I think I was great in this podcast. Yeah. But somebody looked at us, he, what is he on about? He wandered onto Star Trek, he went everywhere. It's, it's subjective. And I would have one view, but ultimately I have an objective I want to achieve and I should be measuring it by the objective. Does it get me what I want? Mm -hmm. Did it help my customers? learn more about us, trust us more, believe us more? Did it convince us, did it convince our viewers who are watching this, did it convince them that we're that little bit better than the other alternative? How would you approach that? As a producer, have you ever had a scenario where you've had a client going, yeah, you're the expert, James. You're the absolute expert. 
we've never done video fil video like this before. You're the expert. And so you think, this is great. The client's going to trust us to get our work done and uh, the project and, and do it really well. And then suddenly they turn into Ridley Scott. Have you ever had that? <laughs> I've had one client who um, was very uh, at the last minute. We, we'd, we'd planned um, the the videos really quite brilliantly. Um, I'm, I'm being careful to, to not give away who this is um, because they might watch. Um, and the, the the set of videos uh, was uh, superb, it, it, and we developed uh, a particular angle for how to uh, deliver them. But then right at the, the last minute, the client insisted on doing something which really negatively impacted uh, the delivery of the content. Uh, but because they were so convincing with uh, that, oh, no, no, we need to do this because it's going to fit in uh, with our company, I went along with it. Uh, but unfortunately, afterwards, it was like, oh, no, I really should, as a producer, I should have stood my ground on that one. Mm. Uh, now, that was quite a while ago, and I'm happy to say that I've, I've not done that since. I mean, you, you are allowed, aren't you, to make a mistake once or hopefully learn from someone else so you don't do it yourself. Yeah. But in that case, I did. Uh, and... You know, I, I think that that's actually a strong requirement of a producer to be able to, first of all, obviously know their subject matter and know how to produce these things, but also to uh, stand your ground if, in terms of uh, keeping the production on point so that you end up with the tool, the marketing tool, uh, that is the reason why you're commissioning it in the, in the, uh, the first place. So I'll tell you a funny story. Okay. <laughs> So this is a few years ago. So um, we, Iris, we were producing a TV commercial for a, a wedding company. We'll say wedding company, wedding dresses, yeah. fancy wedding, very expensive ones. And one of the owners wanted to be in their own commercial. Okay. Right. But not as a kind of, this is my brand, kind of Alan Sugar. He just wanted to be a mm. cast member. And we had a young female bride, mm. and he wanted to be the groom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And we were like, I'm not sure this is a good idea because you're like <laughs> in your 50s and she's in her 20s. And I know we, you know, all the kind of stereotypes have gone away. Now you can marry whoever you want. <laughs> but but it, 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 we were like, I'm not sure this is going to work. We, we went along with it for a little bit, but then on the day of the shoot, it looked like. Basically, a granddad oh, was yeah. was marrying a young girl. And it was like, uh, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And uh, we there were some remarks about it I won't share, but we changed it in the shoot and he became the, the father of the bride. Oh, you did? Okay, All right, nice. Because otherwise it could have, you know, it could have gone... Um, all sorts of ways for sure yeah, yeah but sometimes when you you're kind of so excited about a project like that you kind of lose common sense and you end up where the client who has no experience gets very excited and goes let's do this 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 we we've had this is years ago we had oh, we want to do we, we want to do a scene on a yacht on a little yacht mm -hmm. and we we're like okay we'll film it and this is for life insurance and this old couple on a yacht sailing around. And it was like, yeah, I'm not sure how realistic this is. <laughs> um, but sometimes cl you can get really excited about video and overstretch yourself or, st or parts of your idea take you beyond the story. Yeah. Um, it's really tricky, though, saying no to clients, though, isn't it? What you don't want is a yes man or, or yes woman. Uh, it's that, That's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's yes, absolutely, yes, sure. But uh, it, it does take a, a strong person who knows what they're doing to balance because you never want to upset a client and uh, and just poo-poo them uh, but so long as you as a producer are focused on the end goal and you're you you're able to take a step back and in, and in that case uh, think of all the the outcomes if then you, you can come back to, to the client and, and explain right 
if we go down this route, these are the likely repercussions. Uh, but if we go down this route, then we won't be facing that. And I, I guess we're in a similar situation. I would probably articulate it like, like that then. But but ultimately, strongly, strongly recommend that we take the uh, the the path that's going to get the results uh, needed. And and also. Um, I guess, remind or reinforce the fact that, look, you are the expert. Well, in this case, I, I'm the expert. Um, you've hired me to do a job here, just as you would say, um, well, I know you don't necessarily hire doctors, um, but you wouldn't get involved with how they take do their surgery yeah, operation. They're you like, wouldn't have a doctor, you tell the doctor, I want this medication. Yeah, uh, I want the five mil blade, uh, not 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 the uh, not the one mil blade, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why I hire professionals, and it's because they know what they're doing. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for being. A, yeah, there's a lot to, a lot to be said for being a good client, and that comes for me for being open and honest about budget, and and then. Um, being willing to put your trust in the professional once you've figured out that they they're good at what they do if if you if you effectively and i might be putting you out of business here or losing you some business <laughs> here but if you want to just hire somebody to do as they're told mm -hmm. and film what you want they are the producer yeah yes see, yeah they are for sure but at the same time they've then got to be prepared to take it on the chin on the shoulders when that video doesn't deliver as they hoped it would, mm -hmm. because as you say, yes, they've then turned into the producer, and uh, is that really uh, their core specialism? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be very surprised if it, if it is. So how did you get to be a producer? How did you get into this video production world? Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, how, I, I had to really think about that. Um, honest answer is my hairdresser when I was 16. Uh, we were what? talking. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it goes back a while. Um, uh, conversation was us having, having my hair cut. And uh, oh, was it a man or a woman? I can't remember. I think it was a man, actually. So uh, he recommended I get it, uh, get into uh, into radio. And the hospital radio was a, was a thing at the time. So mm -hmm. it did, did that and had a great time in, in radio. And that, that's... Uh, have you been in radio as well? Yeah, um, a long time ago, yeah. That w you'd appreciate it. So with radio, you've really got to work harder, haven't you? Because you haven't got visuals to yeah. support you. The, 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 what, what's said or, and, and played uh, carries everything. So I had a great time and, and, and really appreciated and, and developed the craft for radio presentation. But then I was, I was pulled into uh, video production and then I went to university and then at uni started working at the BBC. Uh, oh, and, and so then, you're a proper BBC... How long were you in the BBC for? Uh, 98 to 2005. Oh, quite a stretch then. Yes. When the BBC uh, uh, at the time was doing corporate videos. Okay. Uh, yes. And I mean, heck, as, as far as a brand's concerned for corporate videos at the time, y y you couldn't beat that. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, the then Director General said, right, that's it. You guys, you're not allowed to make corporate videos anymore, uh, which then just exploded the corporate video um, uh, production industry in the UK because all of a, all of a sudden the BBC weren't making them. Uh, and then uh, I... I, uh, as a lot, as a lot, a lot of other people did, went right. Fine, we will go solo and uh, and do our own thing. And but as part of that, then uh, the corporate videos. I don't like using the, the term, but you, yeah, you, you know what I mean. Business, yeah, you, yeah. Mar marketing videos, corporate videos. They got ended up getting a lot better because it wasn't then just television people producing it from a television uh, capability. Um, one of the first things I then did. Um, happened kind of naturally was then started studying marketing and and learning about marketing which then what one of the big criticisms of the bbc maybe not so much now but maybe because they use a lot of private studios now mm -hmm. um was um everything was the expensive way <laughs> yeah for sure it was like i i worked with some ex bbc <laughs> people for a long while. it was like we want to do a live broadcast and it's going to be for four hours in one location how can we do it uh -huh. Yeah, we've costed it up. It's a quarter of a million pounds. <laughs> it was like everything was like, it was like there was nothing cheaper than a quarter of a million pounds. No, yeah. That's a really good point. I'd, I'd not thought of it like that. Um, I worked really hard to, uh, to, uh, to 
find efficient ways of producing things. And unfortunately, th- yes, that was, I guess, a bit of a ball and chain that uh, I'd been, not grown up with, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd been taught that, yes, you have to do everything c- completely. And, that, and that's a good thing, doing things properly and to a very high standard. But when it comes to the budgetary side of things, then... Uh, what's feasible for television production or a massive blue chip client is very different to what uh, an SME can likely Mm. afford. And I think as well, though, um, because of the booming kind of commercial video sector, because the BBC ditched its position, it's forced innovation. You know, the new cameras, you can, you, Mm. you know... Um, you can pick up cameras for like six, seven hundred quid that do really decent videos now. Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends on your. No, no you, 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 you're right. It is nuts, yes, because I mean, at the time, a, a broadcast television camera, you know, the big things on on your shoulders. I mean, heck, they were, with the lens and the battery pack, they were knocking on what seventy five, eighty thousand pounds. <laughs> so you're. Uh, if you were in corporate video production for anyone else, you w- weren't. Well. There were, were production companies who had that kit, but they were very few and far between. Generally, people with more prosumer equipment. Mm. Uh, but yes, nowadays, uh, I uh, you can produce some really nice stuff on a, on a lot lo- less uh, expensive kit. Well, to be fair, the cost of the equipment has come down massively. Uh, but the one thing you still won't get away from, though, is the ultimately, regardless of the quality, it's the story, it's, it's the content that counts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, if you can produce that well at the same time, then why not? That's my so, thing. so James, where do you think the future of video is going? The whole metaverse thing. We have to cover the metaverse <laughs> thing, right? Because uh-huh. everybody's like, oh, no, no, it's all going to be 3D in the future. Mm. I know this is kind of off topic, but yeah. I've asked a few people about it. It's all a bit made up at the moment, isn't it, really, the metaverse, right? That's my view. What do you think? I th- I still think it's too early. I mean, heck, I-, I remember watching, I think it was in 1992, the film The Lawnmower Man, where everyone would be in VR headsets. And how many years ago is that? Is that yeah. 30 years ago? We're still not there yet. Uh, and when was it uh, o- Oculus, uh, the Oculus VR yeah. headsets? I mean, they've been around for... Uh, oh Nearly my, 10 years, I think. 10 years, yeah. Pe- we're still not using them. Um I previously was excited uh, about about that, but then quickly realised, hang on, it's 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 just not practical. Um, I don't know why, uh, but in terms of v- uh, where video comes into play uh, for that, hmm, I've seen like some really one. good, like with the Oculus, I got one. And I was like, this is great because I can go to the pyramids and places and I can look around. But then I quickly realized the safety risk of wandering around with this Oculus on, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Uh, and the fact that it actually hurts after a while. Yeah. But yeah, everybody's banking on this and going, this is the next thing. And I'm just not sure how this is going to unfold. I don't know how you, how you create that sensory thing because mm. video gives you the senses but obviously they're trying to add another dimension to the senses mm-hmm. and the closest i've i don't know if you've seen the um there's a film with bruce willis in it called the oh it's gonna bug me now and basically they sit in a computer all on a on a chair all day yeah and they have haptic feedback all over their i body. know the film yeah um I can't think of the name. And I'm like, is that where we're going here? If it is, that's, that's a long way off, I, I think. Uh, in relation to B2B and B2B marketing, I think it's really important to, to stay focused on your goal. You know, uh, And I think um, Seth Godden covered this in, in his book book meatball sunday where he warns against people getting the latest shiny object or the, the latest technique or, or technology and sticking it on their marketing stack and and, and you end up figuratively with a, a an ice cream sunday with meatballs and a load of other <laughs> things that don't go together so 
I wouldn't be in any hurry at all to uh, worry about metaverse and, and VR uh, for B2B. Uh, what I would be interested in, though, is uh, NFTs. Okay. Um, uh, what well, that that one is right around the corner. The, the, there's a there's a marketing chap in B two B that's that's gone big time saying no, it's a scam, um, and it's it's ne- think, never going to play out. But he's I wrong. Think, he's wrong. I think a lot of the current yeah. NFTs are a joke. Oh, you're talking about the, the art ones? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, going to yeah. scribble something and sell it for two hundred million dollars. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that bit is a joke, but I can see how like transferring assets or buying something with a recurring value to it that could be really useful like you know we have like um i saw an idea for an nft where you could invest in say a movie production Mm -hmm. and so you can nft the movie and then you get a cut of the sales nfts work really clever in that way because every ticket sale at the box office it can trickle back and divvy out in a way that any other way would be very complex and expensive. Yes, and underpinning that is uh, the whole smart contract thing. Yeah. And as I understand it, uh, what this stands to be able to do is essentially cut out the movie studios, or in the case of music, uh, cut out the um, uh, the music company because you can then have uh, PR, production, uh, social media, all of these as part of this uh, NFT contract, and these people or service providers are providing it, and they then get released the money yeah, uh, so along you, the way. Yeah, so if you put your music on Spotify, mm-hmm. you could then get all of your commissions, your fan base who have supported you produ- producing it, all of that, and every sale that goes through, you get the cut. The yes. cut is divvied up automatically. I can see that, mm-hmm. and I can I can see how that is valuable. I just think at the moment, everybody's in or still in that speculation. Yes. Did you see the guy who bought the first Jack Dorsey's first tweet? <laughs> Great investment. <laughs> what did he spend? Fifty something million was it? I can't remember. It was something stupid. Yeah, and they couldn't get a thousand dollars for it. Yeah, he was trying to sell it for. A, he didn't couldn't sell it at all. <laughs> A fool and his money is easily parted, I think, is the, yeah. the expression. It's nuts. But I think videos videos around to stay. Mm. It's not going anywhere. At least not until, you know, the me- we all live in this metaverse and we all waste away our bodies on these machines. Video uh-huh. is the most interactive, uh, sensory piece of content you can make. Mm. Of anything mm. you've got. Yeah. That's it. Mm. And... Using it to tell stories is what's getting remembered. That's the crux of what you do, right? Yes. You, you tell a story using clients' experiences to tell a story, land it with other people. And that is a mini movie. We mm. don't know how to think of it like that, but it is a mini movie because there is a story, there is a plot to it, there is an outcome at the end. And just like a movie studio, they want to make money off the back of the video, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you are a movie producer. <laughs> yeah. Um, patronizingly <laughs> said but you are a movie, movie producer you're producing a piece of content that tells a story and engages an audience yes 100% and it just so happens that this particular type of movie ends up with uh, nurturing future clients for a B2B business so James yeah. how does it work if somebody wants you to help them create these compelling stories how do they how do you work with them what's the process they obviously contact you but how do they how does it work sure and do they need a 20 grand budget no no um uh, although you know, 20 grand is a common figure now you mentioned for, it Dean. Now you, yeah 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 uh but in terms of uh, the process. I'm a big believer in in making the effort as a company to deliver great customer service. I, I don't. There isn't a, a, an industry where great customer service isn't a wonderful thing. Uh, but uh, in terms of doing a video case study, it starts with a a detailed consultation uh, with the client to find out about their business in detail. And I, I, I've designed it so that. 
the client doesn't have to do any work or homework or prep work because that's ultimately you, you, the whole, whole idea of it is that you you pay someone to do the work for you. You don't want extra uh, mm. workload on your schedule. So the magic really happens in the pre-production meeting and that's where I just download uh, their brain and find out everything that we need to to be able to understand their business, their marketplace, their competitors, how to sell their product, what makes it great. All of these, and then that get, that um, provides the the direction for which later on we then set about taking in the interview with the client. So it's actually quite a, a simple process for the client. So as far as they're concerned, it's a short it was a short. So it's an hour, up to an hour pre-production interview. Uh, typically, it's forty minutes, but I schedule up to an hour. And after the pre-production interview, we go away, do our thing, prep the shoot, do the arrangements, and then the next big milestone, if you will, is the day of filming. Mm-hmm. And the day of filming is when we always do the the interview first with the client because that's the most important thing. That's when we want to get uh, most completely energy right. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, because you're at your best first thing. And then the the rest of the day then is, uh, as much as we can, spent filming the B-roll footage of the client's business in action and them doing what they do. And then after that, uh, because the pre-production work is so detailed, then and that has driven the the interview we already know in advance everything that we, that the video will cover so when it comes to the edit and the and the delivery to the clients the normal way of doing it is that clients expect to have lots of changes and and amends to it but because we followed a formula and a plan right from the beginning when we present the the finished thing there's typically just a few tweaks that that, that need doing in terms of oh that person's job title might need doing differently or oh we've we've checked with legal and we can't actually say that one thing Mm -hmm. but otherwise then it's really a a three-step process in that part and I think this is a wonderful thing for making things it easy. Sounds pretty easy. Exactly. Yes. So if somebody said, "Yeah, James, let's go," what's that kind of duration, start to finish? That's a good question, uh, and I guess it depends on availability. It and does. Stuff, but the, the big thing that that changes the duration is the availability of the featured clients because we have to work around them. So whenever the 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 person who's going to be doing the interview, when they're available, that can greatly affect it. Uh, I say it's between as little as three weeks, but up to six weeks for you know, kicking off the project, uh, the, the order's signed, and, and then we're, we're good to go. If you had a, a client who's, who's good to go and uh, they were on board and already engaged, then you can easily do that in three weeks. Wow. Uh, Pretty quick, then. What I would add to that, though, is that, and I I, I got this from the um, B2B Buying Disconnect report 2020, is that the number one reason why marketers don't produce case studies anywhere near as much as they should is because of the time, energy, and effort that it takes to produce them normally. Uh, Everyone knows they should be using them more, and everyone appreciates what they do, but it's the time, energy, and effort involved, which is the reason why people don't. So that's why I reverse engineered that and made mm-hmm. it as simple as possible. Cool. Awesome. So James, you're mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. Yes. Where should somebody other than LinkedIn, we'll put your LinkedIn details around this, wherever this is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, where should somebody get hold of you? What's the website that you want them to go to? Should they message you on LinkedIn? How's the best way to reach you? Storyhero.uk. Storyhero.uk. UK. And, um, they're not 20 grand. You can make 20 grand ones, uh, but you price it for small businesses. So it's affordable for, you know, a business owner, a couple of staff. They really want to lay it in. I also think it's quite interesting. If you can do it in three weeks, if somebody was going for a big tender, they could plan this and have this together to go with a tender and kind of use it in a tender, mm. but actually then reuse it over and over and over again. And a good story doesn't date, right? No, and once you've got, you, sh- you should at least have one uh, as well, because from there you can you can start and you can prove the concepts. Uh, but yeah, you need at least one to uh, to give to your sales team for when they're doing presentations, for when they're for when they're following up, uh, and for your marketing team as well for them to be able to use online and so, what's in they the call content. It? Social proof. People yes. are looking for proof these days more than ever. We don't trust. Google reviews. Well, I don't have to watch some of the films I watch and look at the Google reviews. I'm like, how does that work? 
So Google reviews, all of that stuff, for me, you always have to treat it with an air of skepticism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because, you know, you just look and go, that looks made up. But video is something that cannot be, mm. it's, it, you, can't, you can't dismiss from taking, seeing somebody say something about your business and them going, that's their opinion and I'm expect, expecting their opinion. Whereas I look on Google and I go, yeah, Google review. Is that even real? Or like you said, a testimonial or case stu written case study. It's much easier to, what's the word? Add an extra bit of pizzazz. What, yeah, what was the word? Uh, embellished? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, was a term. very polite way of putting it. <laughs> I have my moments. So, James, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for coming on totally unscripted. <laughs> yes, but, but thank you as well. It's been, it's been painless. I'm glad you said painless. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's been good. Thank you. In it's the good, edit, nice. it'll be. It's been pain. <laughs> um, so, guys, do find James on LinkedIn. We'll put his details around here. If you're thinking about using case studies to really convince people to go with you, video is the way to go. Video is highly persuasive. It's much more interactive, and you get to know people better. James, thank you so much. Thank you.